Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we uh, had a couple of interesting events in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I think this is the first group meeting in a little while. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be back with two great presentations. We have two uh, startups uh, lined up today. Um, interesting projects uh, from Imbal Baumar, uh, the CEO from Legal Up, and Jason Morris, uh, who is the developer behind Blocks. Um, so two entering efforts or uh, interesting efforts around uh, document automation as well as uh, declarative uh, programming. Uh, so really excited to learn about uh, what Inbell and Jason will uh, tell us today. Uh, before I turn it over to them, um, does anyone have any news to share or any, any questions for the group? Hi, this is Scott. I'm very glad to say that um, in partnering with edX, World University and School is now offering 29 majors for free bachelor's degrees online, and one of them is law. So um, I hope uh, Stanford Law Codex can benefit from this in the long run some way or another. All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Anyone else? And uh, you can uh, unmute yourself so we can hear you or use the chat function. All right, well, if there are no updates from anyone in the group, I, uh, I will turn it over first to Imbal. Imbal, are you there? Yes, hi, I'm here. Okay, now you can all there see. There you are, great, great to have you. Where are hi. you joining us from? I'm from Tel Aviv, from the other side of the globe. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, oh, hi, okay. everyone. So it's kind of late for you already. It's uh, quite late. Yes, it's what time uh, is it for you? Uh, at the night, yes. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate you, you joining us so late and are excited to, to learn about uh, Legal Up. Thank you. Thank so, you. I'm excited to be here and thank you for inviting me. Great, great. Um, I'll great. just turn it over to you. Do you are you going to show uh, share some slides or, or? Yes, I'm sharing my screen. All right. Please go ahead. All right. Well, over to you, Imbal. We have so we have an hour for two presentations. So if you could keep your remarks to about maybe 15 minutes and keep about the same amount of time for uh, Q and A, that would be fantastic. Okay. Sure. All right. OK, well, can you see my screen now? We can. Great. OK, so uh, in, uh, yeah. So at Legal Up, uh, we build tools to make lawyers more productive. And a short overview about the company. So our primary solution is a document automation, drafting, and an expert system tool. Currently, we have around 130 customers, um, including the majority. Now it's 90% of the 20 leading law firms here in Israel, and we have some uh, customers abroad, and we are in the process of expanding outside the boundaries of Israel now. Currently, we support more than 100 types of uh, legal documents. So lawyers are massive producers of text, Right? We draft contracts, memos, letters, regulations, forms, reports. And I used to be a commercial lawyer myself, uh, working in big law firms and spending countless hours on drafting agreements. Let's speak a little bit about legal drafting. So as we all know, legal drafting is mostly still being done in a manual way and um, it's inefficient and it's quite costly. Um, there are many problems that are associated with um, manual drafting. Um, it's it can be inconsistent, um, it's prone to errors, um, and it takes a lot of time for a senior lawyer and, uh, to, to supervise on a junior lawyer until uh, he can actually draft uh, documents by himself. And this is there is a reason for it, right? So drafting a document is quite challenging. Um, and in most cases, this is not a technical matter. 
uh, if you take 60 different documents with the same title, let's say services agreement, you can see that each one of them would probably be different. It depends whether it's a sell side, buy side, if it's your paper, if it's the counterparty's paper, if it's simple, complex, long, short. Um, so there are many different uh, ways in which to express um, a legal clause. And um, this is why drafting is quite complex. So I've been a, a lawyer and I manage a team of, uh, of lawyers and many times we were drafting documents and the junior lawyer would draft the document and give it to me for, for review. And I would go over it, go over it and say, um, okay, this is good, but uh, in this clause, let's say this is a liability clause, this is not how it should be drafted in this case. Um, you should look for a specific document I drafted sometime in the past, and I remember that there is the right clause that you should use. And, you know, it takes sometimes a lot of time to find a specific document and the specific clause I was talking about. And in another clause, I could have sent him to, to another case and another case, and it just felt very inefficient. As, as a lawyer, you can find yourself looking for a specific clause. You swear you saw somewhere, but now when you really need it, it seems like it's nowhere to be found. Um, and as, at a certain point, I felt that I'm just like mastering my copy-paste drafting skills and, and I can hardly free up my time to work on higher value issues and to identify the non stardom matters and give a more um, tailored and personal service to, to the clients. And if you look on the tasks that lawyers are conducting on a day-to-day -day basis, you see that more than 55% of their time um, is spent on tasks that are prone to automation. And out of those tasks, drafting has the biggest chunk with uh, more than 20% of the time. And we all know that technology has the potential to dramatically change the legal profession and improve the quality and efficiency of legal service, and even to disrupt the way um, law firms or legal departments are doing business, um, but it's, we don't see a lot of usage or enough, to my opinion, usage of document automation. And, and, and this is because it's quite difficult to model the way a lawyer is working. If we could have modeled the way a lawyer is um, drafting a specific uh, document on various cases, um, we would be able to create the legal logic out of it and then transform it into a software interface and streamline the way uh, he's working. Just like finding the recipe of, of a baker of how he's uh, baking uh, his cake. And we actually believe that each lawyering task has its own recipe, sometimes with specific secret sources, but it is possible to find the logic and the modeling behind the way lawyers are working in most of the cases. And I know that what I'm saying is, is not really new and there are a lot of examples of automation and of um, legal expert uh, systems. Uh, one of the most famous one is, is TurboTax, right? right? It's an expert system uh, that can give you a tax advice or recommendation uh, based on your own circumstances or even fill up, fill out your own uh, tax forms based on your own circumstances. And there are some document automation platforms and there are some famous ones like uh, Quantum Express and Hot Docs and expert systems like Neotologic. And Legal Up Current Product is also a document automation system and a drafting tool. So document automation is not new. Actually, the um, biggest players are in the market for around 25 years. Um, but the biggest problem with current document automation system that systems is that they are quite 
um, difficult to use. And the onboarding, the setup of a new project is quite complex. You need to, to be an expert in the system to understand how it works. And normally lawyers are not creating the setup, the onboarding of a new project, but experts in the IT departments or some um, external experts that are doing the heavy lifting of creating a new project. And this is quite costly because you have to pay um, the monthly subscription and on top of it uh, to such experts. Um, and this is why those platforms are mostly used by the higher end of law firms and or of, of corporates. Um, so legal up is a new technology platform and we are now in the process of beta testing of our new self-serve platform after running with our former um, platform for around two and a half years and gaining a lot of experience and insights from uh, customers usage. Um, so now we've developed a self-serve platform that any lawyer can create his own uh, workflows, his own what we call uh, legal documents compilers based on their own content and know-how. How it works very easily. Um, one of the things that are very important to us and one of the things we understood is that it's very important for lawyers to keep their own legal style, their own workflows, their own preferences, um, and to reflect them in the automation project. They don't want us to give them, uh, let's say, an NDA and say, let's use this, or the questions to be asked. Um, they want to use their own content. This is their know-how, this is their IP that they have uh, achieved during the years. And, and we want to promote it, right? We want to take all this know-how and to add to it. So it works quite easily. You upload your uh, template and to Word, uh, to Microsoft Word, um, the platform analyze and map the different clauses and then you create the questions and you create the alternative clauses or the alternative text that can be inserted based on specific conditions, then you can start to use your own workflows. So until now we have created around 100 different um, projects for different legal documents type. And we have actually, uh, gain some expertise in how those documents uh, should look from an automation perspective. So we have developed ontologies and taxonomies for each type of legal documents because we have seen many automation projects for many different clients. So many different styling, many different uh, way of usage, but um, they all share uh, uh, a basis, uh, same basis or same mechanism, which we then um, reducted to our ontologies. So a short example of how it works, right? So I'll show you an example of a privacy policy generator. And again, this is based on a specific client uh, content and know-how. Um, so you see this is a questionnaire, um, there are some questions that are being asked, the user has to fill in the answers. Um, the questions can be very simple, such as uh, some fields, or what is their party's name, etc. And they can go deeper and ask about specific legal mechanisms, uh, about specific legal aspects that are relevant or are not relevant in the case. Okay, so after the user finished answering 
and the questionnaire, the system will uh, generate a Word document with the um, uh, tailored document based on the answers he gave. And then he can review it further, make some changes maybe if it's necessary, and uh, um, send it over to the um, uh, client. Sorry. Um, there are also other use cases, and lawyers are also using it externally, more as a lead generation tool or a way to showcase innovation. Um, so we have many examples of law firms, of the biggest law firms in Israel, that um, develop and we help them their own uh, sites or mini sites where they're where they uh, share some um, document automation templates with uh, the public. So this is one example. Um, she bought a jumpstart. They created a beautiful uh, website based on our platform where they offer um, entrepreneurs and startups, um, founders agreement, uh, basic SPAs, NDAs, um, services agreement, etc. Um, the results of automation are quite impressive. So we managed to save uh, more than 80% of the time in average, sometimes even more than 90 or 95%. So this is very, very um, significant for uh, lawyers, um, which are using different billing models. So nowadays, um, many lawyers are not necessarily um, using uh, the billable hour models, but retainers, um, referred uh, percentages of the, um, of the case and, and some other. So it's really uh, useful. And of course, on top of this, on top of this, there are some other values. Um, they show that while using legal app, they make less errors. Um, knowledge is managed in a better way and even their feeling of the junior lawyer was improved um, because they don't find um, their time like wasted on doing technical work, uh, but they can actually invest their time on, on doing more um, legal intense work and you know, creativity, investing time with uh, um, clients, etc. So, this is um, nice, and I'm, I'm sure you've already seen other examples of document automation. Um, but the biggest challenge we are facing is how to take a lot of different documents and to create them, to, to transform them into a step-by-step -step process. Right? So up till now, up till this point, um, what we have done in Legal App. We, our automation team, has actually created the automation projects for our clients, uh, more than 100 uh, projects like this. This has enabled us to gain a lot of understanding of the processes, of how it works, of the ontologies, of the decision trees that should be made, um, and on how this process should best be formulated. And I want to show you an example, to show you a quick demo of, of our current platform, which as I said, is now in demo because we have now launched, it's still under beta, the self-serve platform where we actually have taken all the knowledge we had until now and I gave it to the users so they can create their own automation projects. Um, so it's actually being done on Microsoft Word. It's um, the way you can create a new project is in, in Word because we know that lawyers are working 100% in uh, Microsoft Word. We don't want them to learn you know, new platforms. We know that um, they are um, 
reluctant to, to change. So we want them to keep on doing what they know, how they used to do. I don't just think it, are you showing parts of your website now? I think we can just see the, the slide. Okay. okay, just a moment. You just have to go into share screen and choose your okay. I'm just browser. Choosing it. Okay, can you see my screen now? We still see the same. You don't see, okay. Just a moment. Share again. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is actually what and I have 10 more minutes left. So, so just want to make sure they leave a little bit of time for, for questions too. Sure. Yeah. So here on the right, you see our plugin. This is how uh, a new wizard or new questionnaire is created. You create here all the questions. Here I can, let's see. This question is you um, pick the type of the question, the values, relative answers, make some configurations. And here you see a mapping of the document. So the, all the different clauses, if I, here I can see the specific clause I'm talking about. Um, the octopus icons represent uh, clauses that have alternative clauses, that they have various, various different clauses. Here you can set, uh, this is still empty, but here you can set um, the um, conditions under which uh, the, the alternative clauses would appear or disappear from the um, uh, document. Uh, here you can also uh, have a quick look on how the questionnaire would look at the end of the process. So uh, this is um, how you build new questionnaire or new project um, in our system. I'm just going back to my presentation, just a moment. Okay, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Okay, so as I said, um, lawyers and technology is not really a love story. Um, um, they want to change, but they don't always have the time and they don't always make the investment in order to really change and adopt new technologies. And we are offering a new approach to this. Um, we believe that the organization's database of the legal documents is actually a gold mine. It contains all the valuable knowledge, all the alternative wordings that a lawyer has ever drafted. And our aim is to utilize these legal corpuses for greater, greater efficiency. I'll just skip this slide because um, I want to finish my presentation in the time we have. So we are now working on our next development, which is actually using AI and specifically NLP to eliminate barriers to use automation tool and to streamline lawyers' work. Um, we actually call it automation to automation. And how is this is done? Um, you upload your documents, um, various examples of the same documents. And our aim is that the platform would suggest the questionnaire and the legal logic for you, okay? So similarly as to what you've seen now in my world, um, I would just upload the document. The system would classify all the variables, would suggest the, rel the relevant questions that might be asked, 
and also would identify the alternative clauses that should be inserted. Um, very briefly, I'll talk about uh, our technology roadmap. So we have uh, a few tasks here. So one is identifying uh, fields or variables in a given question. So we are using uh, name entity recognition models to identify it in a legal document. Another task is clause classifications. Um, we want our platform to be able to classify the different clauses in a legal document and being able to say, this is a liability clause, this is um, extended liability clause, this is um, limitation of liability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then being able to identify other clauses which are similar and suggest alternative clauses. And the system would also um, identify the type of the legal document, of course, and then it would uh, match the relevant ontology and would create the matching between the ontology and all the variables and clauses identified. So it will work relatively um, similar to how it works now, but the first stage would be that the platform would suggest a questionnaire and the alternative clauses for you. And you as a user would only need to check and say, yes, this variable was correctly identified identified, or no, this clause is not a liability clause. This is actually a, another clause and you can pick. And this process would actually help us tagging more and more clauses and variables. So uh, this uh, I actually uh, covered already. Um, and by identifying the clauses, we would be able also to keep them and to suggest them, to suggest a clauses library for future use. So here again, the idea is to automatically recognize the variables and to automatically suggest um, questions. Then after um, this model is built, it would be easy for us to suggest also other very powerful features like auto-suggesting and auto-completing. So when a lawyer will draft a document, not through filling out a questionnaire, but just like his routine work, is just reviewing a document that he received from uh, his counterparty, and he is now on the um, confidentiality clause, he would be able to very quickly through the plugin ask for alternative clauses and the system would suggest him with the most favorable alternative clauses for this clause. We also plan to um, suggest clauses optimizations. We would be able to um, recognize which clauses were used most often, which clauses, which clauses were rejected by the other party, uh, which clauses you know, received specific uh, pushbacks, which one which were accepted very easily, and we'll be able to provide analytics and statistics regarding. Our uh, team uh, includes an amazing group of lawyers and developers. Here are only the managers. Um, our developers have a rich experience in uh, algorithmics, in data science, and NLP, um, both from elite units in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and from the private market, big security companies, and young startups. Um, we also have an advisory board um, that include some very senior people from the legal and tech world, world um, including Dave Lampert, who was the former CEO of Hot Dogs. Um, this is a big uh, competitor of ours, a document automation company. Uh, and he is a big believer in the approach we are taking toward automation. So thank you very much. And um, if there are lawyers in the crowd that want to use to test our beta uh, platform, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. Cool. Can you, Imbel, thank you so much. Uh, can you please uh, uh, put your email address uh, into the chat so people sure. can, uh, can reach out to you directly? Sure. And now, I'm sorry, I, I see that uh, I 
there's not a lot of time left. Yeah, we have a couple of questions from folks, so let's see if we can get to those uh, quickly. So uh, Lyubomir is asking, how does Legal App currently do clause mapping? Is it using human input to do this? And what is the main challenge in automating clause mapping? So, right, so currently, yes, we use a human um, uh, work to do clause mapping, but we are working on a model uh, on clause classification. So we will be using um, some uh, existing uh, models and it's, we are actually training a model based on uh, BERT. Um, so, so this is our major effort right, right now. Okay, cool. Uh, Ray is asking, is there a case management side to see which party trend, trends in rejecting or accepting certain clauses? Uh, currently not, but this is in our roadmap. So we want to manage the whole negotiation cycle. Um, so this this uh, information would be visible. And as again, as I, as I said, we would analyze it and create a lot of very interesting analytics based on it. Yeah, so it's interesting that, um, you know, Nonopa is uh, making that uh, point, you know, in, in the question, how do you plan on using AI to automate automation? And so that's interesting you in your chart, how you showed you're using, I guess, some form of NLP to extract the legal entities. You're saying it, it already extracts the legal logic there. Uh, can it, does it really extract legal logic in terms of like how, you know, the, uh, you know, the parties have to interact with each other? Or is it, or is it more like confined to retrieving sort of legal entities so and then, um, and then, then how do you mix it then you have to mix in your your knowledge base somehow your your ontologies to like then be able to automate i suppose but that's that's i guess that's um uh, that would be interesting to go a little bit deeper on that but uh maybe you can give a short answer to that yeah so um of course it's quite complex but what we are doing is three things, three major things. So first, um, identifying the entities and, you know, uh, numbers, dates, uh, because you know, this number would be the uh, number of shares of a party, et cetera, et cetera. And then we are um, classifying the clauses. We are able to compare different, if, if we say this clause and this clause is um, confidentiality clause and they are different, we are able to compare it. And then we see in our ontology if there is a specific uh, category that can match one of them. And then we already know how to present it to the user because we know what the questions that should be asked and we know um, which clause to match with which answer. Mm -hmm. okay? cool. And this is only a suggestion, a suggestion at this part. We don't um, claim to do it 100%. This is just um, um, an improvement tool for the user. So that's, you know, where you go into like, you're creating a robo lawyer right there. <laughs> so yes, uh, it's, it's very interesting as, as far as I am know, this is the first application of NLP uh, in the field of document automation. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, all right, so Rosanna, because we started a little bit after 1.30, so let's go a little bit more. Uh, so Rosanna is asking, have you thought about, ha have you thought of document automation, a document automation program for litigators? And then uh, maybe uh, I'll take, tell you both questions right now so you can answer both and, and then we have to uh, uh, turn it over to Jason. The second question is from Thabo who's asking, do you think uh, GPT-3 will play any significant role in the legal documentation, uh, legal document Doc, uh, sorry, legal document environments, but specifically your platform. Okay, so I'll answer on the first one. I'm not sure I totally got, got the other one. Um, so regarding litigation, we are currently using uh, legal app also for litigation cases, um, but we plan on automating first the commercial space. So first, we, because uh, the, the, the automation and the ontologies are very use case specific. So we are starting with the commercial space and afterwards we would expand. Uh, currently we are doing also projects in other fields, uh, but those would not be first 
automated in a way of automation of the automation. Okay. And then I'm not sure what GPT-3 is, uh, but- uh, three, yes, okay. So can you repeat, I'm sorry. The, the, the so Thab is asking, do you think uh, GPT-3 will play any significant role in the in um, document automation? Right, so uh, I guess it will be at a certain point. Uh, at this stage, our R&D team uh, doesn't think that it's um, um, adapted enough to the legal space in order to draft uh, autonomously draft um, document or wording, but this is very, very interesting and we are watching closely to see how we can combine it in our platform. Cool. Imba, it's been so great to have you. If, if folks have more more questions, again, please just put your email into the Sure, into the I'll do it. It's Thank been you great to have you. Thank you for, oh, it's, oh, I see it here on the, on the slide. It's actually on the lower left-hand corner. Oh, I see it, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, folks, if you have more questions for Imbal, please uh, follow up with her directly. Um, it was great to have you. This is very interesting what you're doing. And Thank you best of much. luck for it. Um, and please keep us posted. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And it's a pleasure. I'm happy to find some more questions. It's a real offline. pleasure to have you. Thanks again. Uh, okay. So, uh, Jason, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? There you are. Okay. Fantastic. Hey, good to see you. Hello. All right. Jason's, Jason's uh, a re repeat presenter at Codex. It's been a That's little right. bit over a year, I suppose, now that we heard from you from, for the first time, I think, about your work as, a, as an innovation fellow, ABA uh, Innovation Fellow. That's right. And so you're doing some very interesting work around logic programming and declarative programming in the legal space. So excited to learn about what you've been up to with the uh, blogs. Yeah. So I'll just turn it over to you. And well, it's a seven past two and we actually generally have until 2.30. Um, so uh, we can go a little bit over time, but just- I'll try and keep it short. Time. So we have also some time to, to discuss with you. For sure. Uh, I will share my presentation here and you can let me know whether or not that's showing up for you. Yeah, we see it. Great. So uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am Jason. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, my open source uh, project, Blocks. Um, lots of people have been referring to it recently as a startup, and um, I, I'm not sure it deserves that name quite yet. Um, for now, it's an open source software project, uh, and it is for doing rules as code on the web. Um, I make my home in Sherwood Park, Alberta, where I am practicing lawyer and I teach uh, a course in coding the law at the University of Alberta. But I currently spend most of my time on my role as a senior researcher with the Singapore Management University Center for Computational Law, which is a group that is doing research to try and develop a domain specific programming language for legal purposes called L4. And it's intended um, Jason, to be... sorry to interrupt, but we can see your notes front and center over oh, your slide. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me fix that for you. Give me okay. a moment. Sure. I clicked on the wrong share screen. Let me try it like that. How's that working? Much better. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so... As I was saying, um, we're doing work on uh, a language that is uh, going to be used in expert systems and in rules as code and in smart contracts. Um, um, Jason, Jason, sorry that it's showing up again. It is it. Oh, yeah. What's going on here? Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. So if I let me uh, let me try it this way. and share that. Now, can you see the, uh, the browser window there? Uh, yeah, we do see the window. It's, it's sort of in a slide mode. Yeah, uh, let, me, uh, yeah. let me see if I can fix that quickly here. If I click the present button, does that uh, work properly? It does, but you may want to give it another try because your notes may or may not pop up again. And now do the notes show? No. 
Okay, well, we seem to have solved the problem then. I apologize. I don't know why it didn't work the first two times. Um, so uh, blocks is for rules as code. So uh, what does rules as code mean? Uh, it means two things. Uh, on the one hand, it is used to describe um, the result of writing software that automates legal reasoning. You have code that implements rules. So that's rules as code. That's kind of not a new idea. Um, but for some people who uh, who have that role, uh, particularly in the public service, um, they have lamented how difficult it is to encode legal rules because of problems with the rules themselves. And um, that has led for some of these people to um, propose and promote a methodology that they call rules as code. And this methodology calls for drafting legislation and regulations with a computer programmer in the room and drafting them in a computer language at the same time that you draft them in a natural language. The idea being that that would make the implementation of the software easier because it already exists and it's more consistent with the intent of what the law says, but also that, that this process would improve the quality of the laws themselves because drafting them in a computer language at the same time will reveal places where you have done something that's underspecified or inconsistent. And because having that coded version would give you something that it was possible to automatically test uh, in the way that software developers do um, testing. So this is um, an idea that's kind of taken off in the course of the last five years or so, started in New Zealand and then gone to Australia. It's been spreading around the world. Most recently, the OECD uh, has an organization called the Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, and they've released a primer on rules as code for the benefit of governments that are interested in learning more. Uh, and Blocks is listed as a possible tool in that primer. Um, so uh, what would make Blocks better for doing rules of, as code than uh, some of the alternatives that, out there, that are out there, which are basically mostly uh, programming languages? Um, so first of all, the thing to remember is that rules as code is not a benefit in and of itself. The point is to make it easier to automate legal services. And the point of doing that is to improve access to justice. So how does block help? blocks help? It makes it easier as compared to the things we typically use. First, it's easier to learn. And this one bullet point could probably fill uh, an hour long talk on its own. Everyone, you tell people blocks is easy to use and they say, yeah, well, that's nice. But everyone kind of falls into one of two categories. Either they already know a programming language and typically have forgotten how difficult it was to learn their first one, or they've never learned a programming language and they don't know how difficult it is. And so nobody seems to give uh, enough attention to, the, to this problem in terms of user adoption, how difficult it is to learn. So blocks as it is, is better than many of the alternatives, but long-term what I aspire to is something that has the same sort of threshold of entry and immediate return on investment that you get from uh, learning spreadsheets. Um, you don't have to learn all the functionality right away, but you can do something useful really quickly. Uh, blocks is also easier to draft because it uses a declarative uh, logical um, language, which is very similar to how laws are usually drafted. Translating from a natural language into a computer language is difficult enough, but if you force users to also reconceptualize from rules into processes, that makes it twice as hard, and Blocks doesn't require you to do that second thing. Third, rules encoded in Blocks are more reusable than many rules as code encodings we have now, because what you're doing is knowledge representation, not a task-oriented programming task. So what you end up with is not an algorithm for answering one question. It's a knowledge base that you can use to automate the process of generating algorithms to answer any number of questions. So it's more reusable. And fourth, it makes the encodings easier to maintain because you can write as rules and because you can write as exceptions to rules. It is easier to keep a one-to-one -one relationship between the source law and the encoding, which means that if the law changes, you only need to change the corresponding piece of the code. And all of your algorithms for answering individual questions will get updated on their own. And last, it makes it easier to do quality assurance because the language is sufficiently readable and easy to learn that it's possible for more subject matter experts to be able to review code directly. And 
uh, it's possible for them to learn how to do tests themselves. So this is a, uh, a diagram of the, uh, the, the infrastructure, how the tool is built. It's a Docker container that includes a web server and two blocks components. The first is the interface, which I'll show you in a second. And that's built on top of Google's Blockly library. And then the other component is the Blocks Reasoner API, which is built on top of the Flora 2 language Reasoner. So the user who might be at app.blocks.com, for example, uses the interface to generate code, sends that code to the Reasoner to ask questions and get answers. And when they're happy with how it works, they uh, create a .blocks file with that code in it. And then that .blocks file can be used by other tools that also send that code to the blocks uh, a reasoner API in order to get answers to questions. Right now, the only tool that's actually doing that is a library I created called docassemble.blocks that allows you to ask blocks questions in a docassemble uh, web-based interview. Um, Flora 2, why did we go with Flora 2 as the, the background reasoning language? Well. It is in the prologue family of languages. Well, first an aside, as, a, as another connection to these, um, these webinars, I actually learned about Flora 2 by virtue of uh, one of these codex meetings at which uh, Coherent Knowledge did a presentation about Ergo AI, which is Flora 2's commercial big cousin. Um, but it's in the prologue family of languages. It's, so it's declarative and it's logic-based. It's also open source, which is critical for use in public sector applications. But most uniquely, it has defeasibility as a major feature of the language, which basically means that you can write rules that are exceptions to other rules without getting the logic all confused. And if you are looking for an open source declarative logic programming language with defeasibility, the list is really quite short. Um, but we're not married to Flora 2 because the Blocks' infrastructure makes it possible to change the backend language, um, which is why the file that you hand off is a .blocks file, so that if later we want to translate that into a different backend language, that's possible too. We could also give the users the options of which backend language they want to use at some point. Um, that ability to switch between languages is one of the benefits of Blockly. Uh, Blockly is the library. Um, it's based on work done at MIT on Scratch, which is for teaching uh, code to kids. Uh, but it's now it's spun off as a more generic tool and maintained by Google. And again, if you're looking for an open source tool for creating easy to use programming environments, your list is not super long. Um, so this is what the interface actually looks like. Uh, not terribly complicated, which is kind of the point. It has three major parts. On the left is a toolbox where you can grab blocks from different categories and drag them into your uh, workspace. The main area is the workspace where you snap the pieces together and add the information uh, as required. And then at the top there, that little uh, square is a uh, an output area where your answers from the reasoner will be displayed to you. And when you are writing code in blocks, you're going to be dealing with three primary components. And if you've done any logic programming, these will be familiar to you. They are facts, rules, and queries. Each is represented, as you can see, as a puzzle piece into which other puzzle pieces can be snapped. And uh, there's some other first level puzzle pieces like import statements and override statements. But most of what you do in blocks is going to be done within one of these three things. So. Inside of facts blocks, you can set out uh, your ontology. And uh, in blocks, you can set up types, which we call categories. And you can create entities of those types, which are called objects. So when you begin, blocks doesn't know about anything except its basic data types, like string, number, and true or false. So uh, you have to define them, or you have to import them from another blocks file. And there's a few things worth pointing out on this screen that kind of help to understand why blocks makes things easier than a typical programming language. First, you can see that on the left, we've declared that person is a category. And doing that immediately generates the small brown person identifier puzzle piece that is used on both the left and right sides. Similarly, declaring JSON as an object creates the blue JSON block. And declaring name as an attribute on the left created the green name block on the right. So 
blocks forces you to declare categories, attributes, attributes and objects before using them, which makes it impossible to use a symbol that has not been defined or to misspell a symbol. Um, the blocks also do basic type validation, which prevents you from listing, for example, a entity like JSON, where it's expecting a data type like number, for example. Uh, the color coding also reinforces the distinction between classes and entities and helps the user learn what goes where. And uh, the green blocks will only accept uh, values of the correct type or variables. So if you try to put something somewhere it doesn't belong, the puzzle pieces don't snap together. They, they visually won't go together, uh, which helps people get immediate feedback that they are making some sort of syntactical mistake, which makes it a lot easier to learn to avoid them quickly. And uh, this does slow things down as compared to an expert uh, programmer and what they would be able to accomplish in the same amount of time while typing. Um, but speeding the uh, speeding up expert developers is not the idea. The idea is to lower the threshold of entry for uh, beginner developers. So that's rules. Uh, sorry, that's the facts. And then we're on to rules. Uh, here we have two rules. One that says that people are not by default nerdy and the other that sets out circumstances in which that rule um, does not apply. And then there's an override statement there, which is how blocks implements um, defeasibility. You just say which rules override which other rules. Uh, vertically stacking the components uh, implies an and operation in between them. So the rule on the left uh, has a section there that means if the age is less than 44 and the age is greater than 42 and the and comes just by virtue of the fact that they're stacked on top of each other. You might notice that the the not block there says NAF not, and that's because uh, Flora 2 provides standard prologue negation and also something called well-founded negation as failure, which is all I'm gonna say about that because I'm not an expert on logical semantics, um, but if you are, maybe that makes you happy. Um, this screen has most of the features of first order logic on it. Blocks also has some elements for universal and existential, uh, and it also has left to right and bi-directional interface operators, uh, or sorry, inference operators. It also has access to a set of mathematical aggregate functions that I'm not using on this screen. Um, so that's rules and then you get into queries and blocks gives you the ability to set out the question you'd like to answer, uh, which can be a yes, no question which just means that there are no variables in it, or it can be a search question, in which case it will give you a yes if it found any examples and it will tell you what those examples are. So that's the basic uh, interface and um, that's where we are as of today. Um, there, it's, it's still alpha software, um, it's, it's I wrote it in order to demonstrate that these things are possible to do and that these things are possible to do without you needing to learn a, do something as difficult as learn a programming language. Um, I have some short-term goals for how to expand it. I wanna add some data types, specifically dates and times. I'm currently working on a project at Singapore Management University that would allow me to generate explanations for uh, grounded queries in Flora 2 called XF2. And when that is working, it will be very easy to add explanations as a feature to blocks, um, which is a very important feature, both because it makes it easier to debug why your software is doing what it's doing, and also uh, for enhancing the trust that people can have in automated advice by providing explanations for answers and linking those explanations back to the original law that was encoded, uh, which leads to the next two terms which is metadata about where the rules came from and uh, other things that we need to know in order to generate natural language versions of the uh, categories and, and attributes in those explanations. And then eventually what I would like to be able to do is to um, do something similar to tools like Oracle Policy Automation and Neota Logic and uh, Datalex, which is, to be able to automatically generate a web interview that will ask questions of, uh, of the user uh, that it needs the answers to in order to uh, figure out the legal uh, result 
and then explain the legal result all uh, in a friendly user interface without the developer having had to do anything except write blocks code um, and just click publish as doc assemble interview or something to that effect. Um, that's technically possible. The Another piece of the puzzle is another thing that I'm working on at Singapore Management University, uh, which is a project called DocAssemble DA data type um, to make DocAssemble able to automatically generate interfaces. Um, here is a list of uh, links. If you're interested in specific details about what it's like to use blocks for a specific purpose, um, I recommend the link at the bottom there, law.mit.edu. Um, there is an article that I did recently um, called Blocks, a Rules as Code Demonstration, which uh, takes you through the entire process of encoding the rules surrounding COVID-19 testing and isolation in my province of Alberta as they existed last May, um, and then shows how you can use those rules to um, generate a user interview that um, will answer that legal question for people. Um, and that's it for me, uh, except for questions. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, um, I'm at Roundtable Law on Twitter. Uh, my email address, honestly, is not working today, but I'm hoping it'll be working tomorrow. There's a problem with my DNS servers, so I will put an alternate email address in the chat for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah, we, we noticed that. We got, a, we got a bounce from your email. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, great. This is so cool. Very interesting. Uh, and it reminds me, like, now as part of, like, uh, schooling my kids uh, at home, uh, there's some of the coding exercises uh, for the kids. They have the same <laughs> same interface, and uh, and it's very intuitive and it's great. Um, yeah, I wonder like how much closer you know how how much closer you think you are to making legal coding accessible to domain experts. You know, and you uh, probably have some idea from your from teaching it to law students. Yeah, I mean the the, the things that I'm teaching to the law students is actually primarily in Python. So yeah. it's, I'm not, I, I would like to be able to kind of uh, experiment with my open source project on the university students, but I think I should probably ask the university's permission first. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure on that basis. And um, I'm certainly not satisfied with how far I've gotten uh, yet. I, um, I, don't, I, I don't know that you can solve this problem merely on the basis of interface. I think it's also a, a, a problem of um, creating the educational materials that take you slowly through the process and, and take you step by step in, in a way that's understandable. Um, so I think there's a combination of factors there, but I, I like to think of it as um, trying to uh, dig a way out of uh, a prison with a spoon. Um, we're maybe halfway through the wall and we'll find out what problem we have when we get to the other side of the wall. <laughs> That's a good way of saying it. So uh, there's a question uh, from PLD. How do you describe chain of uh, legal events in blogs uh, or describe temporality of facts when uh, required in a legal rule that has some temporal orders? Uh, yeah. I found it difficult to express in logic oriented languages. Yeah, you are not alone. Um, that's so. the The plan um, right now is to first expand uh, blocks with the data types that it would need to be able to do dates and date times and durations of that sort, but then also to generate a um, essentially an event logic library. So, um, if your legal pro problem is one in which you need to be dealing with um, things. The, the truth of which change over time, then uh, events and fluence and um, objects that are designed specifically to solve that problem um, would be uh, available to you. Um, one of the things that I'm, uh, that I'm a fan of for solving this problem is something that's done in Oracle policy automation, which is that by default, all variables in Oracle policy automation are fluence, which is they can change, the value of them can change over time. And so you have access to temporal reasoning always. Um, I'd like to get as close to that as possible because that seems to be like the, the least friction way to get those features in, in front of people. 
Um, but that's the current plan. First, add time data uh, elements, and then try and build some sort of temporal logic library that would help. Mm -hmm. And since you're, I mean, you're, you're publishing this in open source, I assume mm -hmm. people who are interested could then contribute and help, help you. Absolutely. Uh, it is on uh, GitHub at, at github.com slash blocks slash uh, blocks, B-L-A-W-X. If you are a logic programmer or you've done any uh, web server development, or even if you are good at writing documentation, um, there's lots of places that you would be able to help and I would be extremely appreciative. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Anatoly is saying that's great. Is it meant mainly for the public bodies or uh, maybe used by commercial entities? If it's open source, you can't use it for commercial usage. Is that right? Would there be a license of some kind? So um, the, the license under which it is released is the, uh, the MIT license, which allows for commercial usage. So there's, if you want to take blocks and, and uh, use it for commercial purposes, there's absolutely no problem with that. Um, it is targeted at the rules as code task, but the technology itself is not specific to that task. So you could use it for smart contracts. You could use it, uh, I mean, I could conceive of, of using it to kind of supplement the kind of logic that something like legal up does in document generation. If part of your document generation process was dependent on uh, rules that were in a law somewhere, um, that might be an effective way of doing it. So there's lots of things you can use it for, no restriction on commercial. Um, what might happen at some point in the future is I might try, uh, and this would be the potential startup, um, is to try and uh, turn it into um, software as a service and uh, create a service where you can go in, you can edit your, uh, your blocks code. But in addition to being, being able to do that basic stuff, it also allows you to instantly publish your code as an API that's now available to your applications or to other people's applications and allow you to control access to that API and maybe even charge for access to it. Um, to make it viable as a platform for digital uh, knowledge engineering. Cool. All right. Uh, OK, so maybe. All right, great. Scott is saying, um, in what new ways could you see developing a course for undergrad law students on blocks coding in the EDX platform? Where do you see blocks heading and beyond uh, for Canada and Singapore, too? Yeah, I, I, it's, um, so the, the, the challenge, I would like very much to be able to get uh, more students kind of playing with blocks because that would help me learn what parts of it I'm doing right and what parts of it I'm doing wrong. It would be valuable user feedback. Um, the problem is nothing like this exists right now in the market. And so it's, it's difficult to sell to law schools as a thing that's going to be valuable to students after they graduate. Um, because it's not going to be available to them after they graduate. For now, it's essentially just a, a research experiment. So um, I, I have some uncertainty about how well that would work inside the formal legal education system. What I am considering doing is whether there would be a market for doing like a Coursera style online uh, course for people who are interested in doing logic programming in law and kind of seeing how it works. Um, that seems more feasible in the short term. But um, as I say, uh, and Neotologic is a good example of this, just giving people these tools is not good enough. You also have to put a lot of effort into educating people on how to use the tools. And that's the place where I think Neotologic has succeeded where other people have failed is with the amount of effort that they have put into uh, training. Mm, interesting. Well, super. This is super interesting, and uh, would love to, you know, go on and to find out more about uh, your plans for for blogs and learn about what you're up to in Singapore. And with, you know, I assume you you're working with our friend uh, Meng there. Yes. Yeah. He was a uh, was a fellow at Codex. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, so um, so yeah, this is fantastic. Really uh, appreciate that that update and a really exciting work that you're doing. Um, Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. You, it's great. And, and you already, some folks want to reach out to you directly. Anatoly, I think uh, Jason already shared his uh, email in the chat. If you scroll up a bit. 
Yep. It's Jason at lexpedite.ca. Uh, uh, That's right. And uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us. Um, Inbal, thank you also for joining us. Thank you both for all the great work you're doing and for sharing with our thank community. You. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. And uh, we'll be, uh, Susan, what do we have next week? Uh, next week, we actually have a, another speaker event. Um, so Allison Konecki is going to be talking about uh, racial disparities, uh, disparities with speech recognition systems, uh, part of the Fair Speech Project out of the Computational Policy Lab. Uh, she is a graduate student, uh, a PhD student um, doing graduate work at Stanford. So uh, tune in for that. You should all have email on that or uh, go to law.stanford.edu slash events, November 5th. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all. Good to see you all and uh, have a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.